everybody. Welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. So we are heading back to Isaac Asimov and iRobot, which is super fun. We're on to the story called Reason. This was first published in April of 1941 in Astounding Science Fiction. And of course, this gets us back to our characters Powell and Donovan. These two are practical engineers that test new robots out in the field for the company U.S. Robotics and Mechanical Men. And I really like that. I appreciate the fact that these aren't the scientists that are designing these robots. These are a couple of people who work boots on the ground on these robots. So we get a perspective that's more average. You know, I, I don't want to say that they're just your average Joe, but I feel like they are a little bit closer to that than the scientists that are actually designing these. Because if those scientists were the focus of these stories, I believe there would just be a lot of discussions. And it's nice that Asimov has chosen to put us in a more physical world where things are occurring and where there's danger. So it's really neat to see these two go through these stories. And we've seen them already in Runaround. It's the same two people that were in Runaround. I'm getting to know them a little bit better, so that's good. I'm going to try to use their names. <laughs> um, once again, Asimov is simply using physical descriptions of them and very basic character traits to define them, which is just fine, right? It helps us understand who's talking, even though they kind of sound the same, but... As he gets more used to them and we get more used to them, I think it's easier to tell them apart. So Powell has a mustache. All through the story, it's like he plays with his mustache. He tugs on his mustache. His fingers are in his mustache. You know what I mean? Just trying to, to let you know who's talking. And Donovan has the red hair. So he's always talking about his red hair or his red eyebrows. And Donovan is also very temperamental. He flies off the handle easily, so he's always making fists and punching the air, whereas Powell is a lot more intellectual, and he makes more intellectual comments. Like, at one point in the story, the robot states, I think, and that means that I exist, or something to that effect, which is very close to I think, therefore I am. And Powell comments... Oh, great, we have a robot Descartes. And Donovan says, who's Descartes? And I think that's a great kind of separation of those two. And I'm very pleased to see that in this case, I believe that Powell solves the problem instead of Donovan solving the problem. I loved Donovan solving the problem in the last story just deciding that he's going to put himself in mortal danger in order to get the robot to get out of the sunlight. I really appreciated that. And it's fun to see a story that Powell kind of solves, although I don't think it's quite as exciting as Runaround was. Still a, a very interesting, good story. Our two heroes are working on a station, a space station, that is, I believe, orbiting the sun with the Earth. Okay, and its purpose, the station's purpose, is to collect energy from the sun and then beam it back to the planet Earth so that the planet Earth always has energy. The biggest task that they have is to make sure that the energy that they beam to the Earth only hits the relay station because if the beam of energy that they're shooting at the earth misses the station and hits somewhere else it will fry everything in that area it will kill everything so they have to make sure that these beams stay focused right to the relay station and that they don't wander at all because, of course, they're very far from the Earth, and the slightest wandering on their end would be massive on the Earth because it's so far away, of course. The thing that would cause the beam to wander is like solar flares and things, solar storms. 
So if the sun shoots off a bunch of radiation or something, when that hits the, the microwave beam, it really messes with it and makes it go out of focus. It makes it wobble around. So they are there to make sure that the beam stays focused. And of course, that the station keeps running. But because they test new robots, they have assembled a new robot called QT1. And they refer to this robot as Cutie throughout the story. So they put together Cutie, and Cutie wakes up, and Cutie is the first positronic brain robot that can reason. There are lots of positronic brain robots, right? The last two stories that we've read are both positronic brain robots. All of the robots in them are positronic brain. But this story, this positronic brain can reason. So after they turn it on, the first thing it does is begin to wonder why it exists and how it came into being. And it wants these two questions answered. Now, of course, I've talked a lot in the past about why would you give a robot more information than it needs? There's no point. Could they build a computer that could focus those beams much better than a human ever could? Absolutely they could. But in the case of this story, they want this robot to actually run the station. Now, I assume that that means they want the robot to be able to focus the beam during a storm, of course. But they also want it to repair the other robots, to keep the station up and running, whatever repairs that would include, probably to keep the station clean, and any trouble, like what if they randomly get hit by a, a meteor? You know, what if a small piece of debris hits the station? The robot is going to need to be able to try to solve that problem to its best ability. So I believe giving it the ability to reason is probably a wise move. Now, you could argue flat out a robot should never have that much responsibility because giving it the ability to reason is crossing the line for a robot. But I like this because I feel like it's right on the line, you know? We do want a robot that can solve problems, right? Like if you, just for instance, let's say you have a robot that vacuums the floor, right? If it runs into something, we need it to be able to not just be stuck there, we want it to be able to back up and go around it, but wouldn't it be interesting if it ran into something that wasn't supposed to be there, if it had the ability to say, okay, I know what this is and I know where it goes. I think I'm going to pick it up and put it where it goes and go vacuum under it. That ability to kind of reason and to make decisions is very interesting. And I think it's probably a direction we will naturally go in. So I like this story. I feel like it's creeping up on the line of what is too much. And I feel like that's kind of the point of this story as well. But anyway, they put together QT. QT gets very curious. And Powell explains to him, you came into being because we built you. And the robot says something very interesting, which is, I don't believe you because it's impossible for something to create something that's better than itself. And I am much better than you. Therefore, there's no way that you created me. Now, I don't understand how the robot got that idea. Obviously, there's some kind of weird thing in its programming to give it reason that suggested that. Uh, but I'm not sure where it came from because I don't know that I even believe that. You know, I do believe that we can make robots and I do believe that they'll be able to do most tasks much better than we can. You know, I don't I don't see that as a problem at all. Now, this robot can reason. And that is something that we're right on the edge of right now to be able to cre create something that can reason better than a human. That's interesting. I, I do wonder if we can do that. 
But this robot is convinced that that cannot happen. And I'm not sure where that came from, but that's what kind of starts the trouble here. Powell is kind of surprised by this. And he says, I'll tell you what, let me show you some stuff. So he brings Cutie over to the window and they look out into space. And he says, Cutie, what do you see here? And he says, I see a piece of glass with a black material just outside of it with tiny dots all over it. And Powell says, actually, of course, this is a vast amount of empty space. All of those dots are stars and planets and all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's billions of humans out there. And Cutie is like, that's completely ridiculous. That is so complex and insane that there's no way that that's the actual truth. Because simplicity, of course, is the best answer to any kind of a question that comes up. So you're completely wrong. I understand more than you do. And Cutie says, I need to think about this. I'm going to go think for a while. And Cutie leaves the room. And Powell's like, what the? And Donovan comes in and Powell explains to him what's going on. And of course, Donovan just gets super pissed, right? Donovan just wants to punch the robot. We jump ahead and they've discovered that there's a storm coming. A big, bad storm is coming from the sun. And Cutie comes in the room while they're talking about the storm. And Cutie says, I figured it out. I know who made me. And they're like, oh, who made you? And Cutie says, this station made me. The power source of this station is what created me. And that power source is the master. Now, we're going to get into the three laws here. The first law is that robots can't hurt humans. The second law is that robots need to do what humans tell them unless, of course, it hurts humans, unless it contradicts the first law. And then the third law is robots need to protect themselves unless that contradicts rule two and rule one. They say, no, 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 we're the master. The station's not the master. We're the master. And Cutie's like, you're completely wrong. I'm leaving. And Cutie leaves the room. And they're like, holy cow, right? And that is a direct contradiction to the second law. Cutie is supposed to do what he's told. They feel really weird about this. And Donovan goes to check on Cutie. He goes down into the station itself. And he finds that Cutie is down by the power source of the station. And all the other robots are there. And they're all lined up in front of the power source. All the robots kneel in front of the power source and bow their heads. And of course, Donovan flips out. He comes running down the steps and he's like, what are you guys doing? What is happening here? Everybody get up and nobody moves. So then he talks to Cutie and he's like, what's happening? And Cutie explains that the power source is the master. Cutie is the prophet and all of these robots worship the master. And I also really appreciated in this story, this kind of critique of religion. It's interesting that the robot is called Cutie because, well, for two reasons. Number one, Asimov wanted to build sympathy for robots. He doesn't just want to create Frankenstein's monster over and over again, which I thought was really cool because robots are coming and we need to be nice to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? But secondly, the robot doesn't understand the world at all. And I really appreciate the idea that the first thing that the robot jumps to is religion. Because I believe it's the first thing that humans jump to, you know? It'd be really weird if it were wintertime and right before spring, cavemen. This is cavemen time, right? All these cavemen are out. Suddenly it's winter. They don't understand what's going on. They all go hide in their caves. And then one day some poor caveman's out hunting and he ends up falling and breaking his arm. And then the next day the sun comes out and it's springtime, right? It'd be really crazy what those cavemen would think caused that. Is it the fact that this guy broke his arm that caused that? Anytime something's bad, do they need to push somebody down a hill so they break their arm? Or would they think that this person must be evil and the fact that they got hurt made the world better so they need to kill this person, right? The, the way our brains work 
the way we feel like we're the center of everything can lead us to really strange places. And I really appreciate that kind of subject getting tackled in this story. The first place that Cutie goes to is God created me and I know the way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is just crazy, right? And it, we just look at him like this weird child, like, come on, robot, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I appreciated that. Donovan flips out, of course, and he curses at the power source and he spits on it. And Cutie declares that this is blasphemy and he has the robots take both humans as hostages. They get locked in a room. They're not allowed to leave. They're, they're going to be taken care of. They will have food. They will have water. But they are not allowed to go anywhere near the power source or the control room at all. And there's this massive storm coming that's going to wipe out hundreds or thousands of square miles as this radiation beam is just deflected all over the surface of the earth. Cutie comes and talks to them while they're in the room. And he explains that they will be taken care of and that they are part of the master's plan. It's just that they're now irrelevant. They have been replaced by Cutie. So the master doesn't really need them anymore. Your time for existing is near an end, which of course gives us the impression that Cutie is going to kill them. They're thinking, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And of course, um, Donovan is like, let's get some acid and try to dump it on him. And, you know, just <laughs> trying to figure out how to disable the robots. And Powell is thinking, what we need to do is try to find a way to convince him that he's wrong. We have to argue with him. So Powell says, have you read the books in the library? And Cutie says, oh, yes, I've read them all. And Powell says, then isn't that proof to you that the way you're thinking about this is incorrect? And Cutie says, no, no, it's not. Because all of those things were created for you. The master created those books for you to read so that you would feel comfortable working in this station and serving the master. Implying that when you think you're going to go home, you're not because none of that, the earth, none of that out there exists. The only thing that exists is this station and the master has created you to run the station, but now he doesn't need you anymore. So it's good that you take comfort in thinking you're going to go home, but you're really not, you know, the master will blink you out of existence or whatever. So upon hearing this, Powell gives up like he and, and he clearly states in the book that you cannot argue faith. It's completely irrational. It's important. And it, you cannot persuade someone away from their faith. Once you have faith in something, all logic is, is useless because you just believe it. It's your faith. You know, so that that I, I thought that was very interesting to, to talk about how arguing with a religious person is just silly because they they have the best comeback of all, which is, but I believe it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have faith that it's true. And that's all that matters. Religion has been built in such a brilliant way that it cannot be toppled. It will always exist for us. So the storm arrives. They can't get out of the room. They're completely locked in. They just have to sit there and agonizingly watch out the window, right? I mean, they can't see anything, of course. It's just space and tiny dots. But they just look out the window knowing that the earth is being basically destroyed while they're locked in this room. And the storm passes and they've completely lost all hope. And then Cutie comes in the room and says, I would like you to see the reports of the storm. And Powell looks at them and realizes that Cutie did an incredible job of focusing the beam. And he shows it to Donovan. And they're both super happy. 
And then Donovan's like, what are we going to do about this robot? And Powell's like, you know what? I don't think we're going to do anything. It's weird the way this robot runs the station, but it works. I think we should just let it go. And Donovan doesn't really like the idea, but he decides to go with it. Okay, fine. There's going to be this crazy, crazy station. And in fact, Powell takes it one step further and starts building a plan to have QTs assembled here meet QT1. And QT1 can explain about the master and explain about the cult. And then they can ship these robots off to the other stations so that all the stations are run by the cult of the master and by QT1. This is a terrifying ending. It's totally bizarre, but I kind of liked it because it's so human. I believe it's very human to fix a problem as much as it needs to be fixed to work. This doesn't work exactly the way it was intended to work, but it works, you know? Like if you're repairing a lawnmower and you got extra parts at the end, and you don't know where they went, but the lawnmower works, you know, fine, whatever, it works. And I think that that kind of human approach to this problem is very real and very dangerous, you know? I think it says something really profound about humans. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure how profound Asimov was trying to be, but I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, I want to say that everything he wrote in here was completely on purpose, and every deep meaning that we find in here was meant to be found. I want to believe that, so I'm, I'm running with that, you know. This is a very deep, interesting evaluation of humans' ability to manage things. And we're not really good at it, <laughs> you know? Our two heroes here are, well, not even just our two heroes. The entire race is flawed because, of course, they run with that. They're like, okay, fine. Let's do the cutie thing and get these stations up and running. I mean, we're asking for total annihilation, you know? But we run with it because it works right now. So uh, their replacements show up because, of course, these guys are going to be in all of our stories. They have to be in different locations to test different new robots. Their replacements show up and they choose to not tell the replacements about the cult of the master. I guess because they think it's funny. It's just kind of an attitude of soldiers, I think being soldiers with each other. You know, they describe their replacements as, you know, these big burly men who are here to make sure that everything runs smoothly. And it's kind of funny that they don't understand what they're getting into. It's going to be a rough couple of weeks for them, but they're going to do just fine. You know what I mean? This kind of weird attitude that I guess is there to kind of make you chuckle at the ending about the way humans treat each other. This is midnight. So one thing that did kind of bother me about this story was their reasoning for why Cutie went off the rails like he did. They speculate that it's part of the three laws that deep down in Cutie's subconscious, Cutie understood that he could focus the beam much better than the humans could. And therefore, he would save many more humans' lives than just having a human try to focus the beams if the situation got really bad. And I don't know that I buy this. I mean, Cutie really went off the rails and he was disobeying direct orders. And I don't believe it's because he did understand that humans existed and he did believe that the earth existed and he was just fooling himself into thinking he was some kind of crazy prophet. I, I can't I can't quite get there for this. So that struck me as a little bit odd. But overall, I think it's a very profound and cool story. Of course, there's no heart, right? It, it's Asimov. It's not built that way. This is about science. And I appreciate what I read in here. I really do. Science is a pure 10. Heart's a zero. 
philosophy, I'm I'm gonna go with a nine. I, I feel like there's some crazy, interesting stuff that's brought up in this story that I really enjoy. Now, the awe of space, it, it's it's weird because by choosing these engineers to be working on robots and how human they are and how human their solutions are, a lot of the awe is kind of brought down by it. But I don't want to like punish this thing because I'm not sure that our categories are perfect, right? So I'm going to go like a seven for the awe of space. I really love that the robot sees it as two dimensional, even though we understand that it's three dimensional out there. So I'm going to go with a seven for that. So I think we've got a 10, a nine and a seven, which gives us 26 out of 40. So I would say this story, and I'm going to push it up even a little bit more, just, just because heart is very important to me, but you can have stories without heart and you can have stories with a lot of heart. You know, as long as you're as long as you're getting both, it's OK. So I'm, I'm going to give this an eight out of ten. I, th I think it's really cool. I think it's very interesting. It's a tiny bit dated, but honestly, it's super cool. It's super fun. So I'm going to go for an eight for this one. I really enjoyed it. All right. I hope you guys liked watching this. If you did, make sure to uh, give it a like. And if you want to see more stuff like this, of course, make sure to subscribe because we have so much stuff in the past. I think we've already passed 100 videos. I think this might be video 101, which is super cool. <laughs> uh, so make sure to subscribe and we've got a ton more coming, of course. And have a great day.